Thank you, um, Dr. Zray. I am um, very happy to uh, be the person who is um, uh, concluding because I am actually uh, going to say that I know that you are, or I am, the last thing between you and freedom today. Um, and I realize that uh, uh, my, my friend and colleague and uh, uh, mentor in some ways, uh, uh, Ahmed, uh, has taken up uh, a little bit uh, extra time and I'm also aware that we need to talk. So I will I've kind of reorganize what I'm presenting to make it a little shorter. Um, <clears throat> I will address the highlights Islam, Islam. I will address the highlights of the paper in progress uh, and will present, if time allows, uh, uh, a quick project uh, or a project quickly that exemplifies uh, one way to engage in publicly engaged scholarship, although I do not think we'll have the time for that. The topic of this conference is vast and perhaps unruly. This panel on publicly engaged scholarship narrows things down a bit, but actually not by much. My presentation focuses on context, opportunities, and limits within which publicly engaged scholarship might take place. And it will be a little different than a lot of the other presentations as it will look at the broader context. I will naturally reiterate some points that have been uh, shared earlier in the conference or some points I shared in my opening statement, but will keep the discussion at a broad level within the presentation, and I hope we can go to the details in the Q&A. For instance, at some risk, I will not be distinguishing between private and public universities or between different locales unless it is of prominent significance. And clearly, not all commentary applies to all universities. AUB is different from Duke University in some ways, and both are different from a university in rural Egypt or Yemen. As far as location, it is tricky. Uh, it's actually quite tricky. While one should not e erect rigid boundaries that reproduce a depoliticized distinction between East and West and terms of the sort, we sometimes do have distinct contexts in which free and critical thought and production is simply not possible or not advisable. I need not provide examples, I assume. Suffice it to say that we should not make too much of these distinctions between locales even if we are aware of them, especially during the current period where things and processes are growing increasingly alike most, in most of the countries we come from or are discussing, as, process, as processes that reflect a sustained pressure on what, we can, or what can be called a global political economic order, coming from that old cliche, uh, the power of the people, the public, and so on, are happening nearly everywhere. I start with the timing of the conference, which is opportune, and address the first concern, which is context. Context, uh, opportunities and limits. I'm gonna start with context. And here, I'm referring to more global factors than regional ones, such as uh, the Arab uprisings, for instance. I'm not addressing those which is a good case study in all cases, the Arab uprisings, that is, of tremendous failure in terms of publicly engaged scholarship or knowledge production. The context in which we find ourselves today, globally and locally, is not just another factor. And it hasn't been discussed uh, sufficiently, largely because we actually had really good papers on specific topics. Despite variations that we can parse out endlessly, today we are facing a sort of global assault on what universities have come to stand for from both state and market. I use the word assault because it is fitting. It is fitting not in the sense that you can feel or witness it at every point. On the contrary, this characterization may sound a bit off or exaggerated for many participants in the university system, globally uh, and locally, precisely because it is not always ubiquitously evident for all, nor is it necessarily offensive for many. However, I use the term in a historical sense. During the past two decades, some say a bit more, we, have, uh, we can witness a steady process in which market via neoliberalism, in quotation marks, because it's become a word that is almost becoming meaningless, like the word terrorism, but it's a quick reference. So we can witness 
a steady process in which market via neoliberalism and state via repression have been gradually transforming the university environment not only back to its elite origin, but to an instrument for the reversal of progress in the service of elite networks, exclusionary markets, and brutal stability. Here, I will skip a bit of the text, uh, and I hope I can unpack things in the Q&A or in the final paper. This transformation must necessarily be violent going forward. I'll try to explain why. Exclusion in former periods was a norm, a feature of the liberal state, the colonial state, in mostly agrarian societies or liberal elite dominated societies. Today, exclusion has to contend with mobilized working classes and other groups who have access to instruments of power who are often connected globally and whose participation in the new system that is being woven is actually needed. In other words, one of the contradictions of the development of global capitalism is that it cannot endlessly prey on the local population within one's own country. In the past, colonialism provided an exit and various other adventures. Today, such ventures of empire still exist, but are steadily narrowing and are often producing counterproductive consequences. Notice the calls for self-isolationism and protectionism among many politicians in powerful countries. In all cases, within particular locales, you can no longer rely on the docility and utter impoverishment of excluded groups. On the other hand, you cannot rely on the sole purchasing power of the elites or on their foreign exploits. Exclusion today, even when successful, is potentially quite costly. The tentative conclusion here, which opens the door for a discussion of opportunities, is that exclusion is no longer compatible with stability. No matter how intuitive this might be as we look, at, as we look around us. Intuitive as in exclusion and stability seem to be compatible and intuitive, but it actually is not. Exclusion and instability will increasingly go hand in hand in most cases for more reasons than uh, one can showcase in a short presentation. In fact, I will skip a bit here. As we can witness in increasing parts of the world during the past decade, exclusion in its economic and political varieties an artificial distinction to be sure, has engendered violence and instability of a more enduring kind. The period after the 2008 economic crisis in the United States is a new era of sorts. The same applies to the still unfolding uprisings and counter revolution in the Arab world. We can also point to other cases such as Greece and beyond. I am not speaking of a radical and, and an immediate change globally, but about different modes of dealing with crisis. With, different, with very different trade-offs that themselves provide opportunities for publicly engaged scholarship and knowledge production. Paradoxically, the powers that be within various locales or countries are stuck. And one can look at different case studies and countries to actually ascertain this process. On the one hand, they have no repertoire of groups left to exclude locally, more or less, and not in the same way this has been done in the past century, let's say. On the other hand, they are unwilling to offer real and meaningful inclusion. Thus, there seems to be a few alternative courses of action for the elite at the global and local political economic levels. The first course of action refers to creative forms of exclusion, and we can talk about that. The second is further repression, subtle and not so subtle, and the third, is ideological maneuvering, especially within hegemonic systems, because ideological maneuvering in other places, like in the region, is not going to work extremely well uh, in most cases. Not in all cases. The opportunities ahead for publicly engaged scholarship amid increasing commodification and repression lie in the fact that any and all of these courses of action, which we are seeing unfold before our eyes here and abroad, are producing further instability. This is reinforcing a more stringent application of the aforementioned alternatives, leading to the eruption of more islands and modes of violence and a sense of ubiquitous instability, which has actually began some, for some time now to reach countries that were historically stable. 
In more directly repressive states, this is further stripping the state of any modicum of legitimacy and creating opportunities for medium and long-term mobilization that will reproduce what we have witnessed during the Arab uprisings, whether or not some of us feel or opine that counter-revolutions have triumphed. I simply do not disagree. I do not agree that this is a terminal victory for counter-revolution, even in the medium run, but that's a different issue altogether. In more liberal contexts, such as the United States, liberal, uh, the loaded word, a strained term to be sure, this increase of violence to restore stability has begun in the past decade to chip seriously at whatever notion of hegemony that existed in these contexts. In the absence of hegemony, which is itself a complex term, or as it breaks down, the role and effectiveness of ideology, the third course of action mentioned above, is diminishing considerably. And that opens the door for a lot of um, opportunities. This outcome presents vast opportunities for academic engagement. It is here where academics who wish to have an impact on, on the public need to be sober and strategic in terms of both collective action and long-term planning and thinking. In such environments, the doors that used to be closed, the ears that used to be clogged, and the horizons that used to be blocked all begin to open up, even if slowly. These sorts of emerging opportunities are not to be belittled, even as they seem modest. They are also not to be exaggerated. Hence, the importance of thinking collectively and strategically. And here, there's a lot to say on various contexts, in various countries, and various modes. OK. This brings me to the third point, which is uh, limitations. University environments are conducive to critical thinking, networking, and mobilization. We would be foolish to not recognize the limits of such environments and thus the limits of publicly engaged scholarship at once, as much as we would like to push those and as much as we've talked about them. If we, in my view, do not recognize the limits, we would simply be using the wrong tool for the wrong thing. It is also foolish, even unproductive, to ask too much of intellectuals sometimes, while it is somewhat cowardly to expect that we have no power or role in the public realm, even if in more repressing environments where the odds are stacked against intellectuals or scholars. We should not expect the university environment to be the arena where we both start and finish. On the contrary, part and parcel of the productive limits I am referring to is to recognize when, where, and how to hand over the baton or task to other forces, spaces, groups, parties, movements, and or environments, because the alternatives differ in different contexts. It is the peculiarities of these limits or thresholds that I think should be discussed further depending on context, not their actual existence, because they do exist. There are no contexts within which publicly engaged scholarship is unbounded. There is a time and place for everything, but those who never identify a time to fight hard or go to war, so to speak, in certain contexts, or shy away from any disruption even when the context calls for it, are rather cowardly, and it's okay to use such terms. By the same token, those who simply want to raise their voice and lash out prematurely or constantly at the system, whatever that is, are naive and essentially not effective and could be counterproductive. I'll share why this is significant. Absent the power of ideological maneuvering by dominant cultures, states, and elites, it is this kind of unproductive incitement on part of some otherwise progressive forces that is used as fodder to mobilize the mob against real change. This is also another topic to address in detail. My aim here is not a blueprint for public engagement. Rather, it is to recognize the broader contours within which such engagement might take place and to maximize the effect of public engagement based on carefully knitted and examined case studies. 
In down times, that is, in times when more intense public engagement is not possible or productive, we academics can do so much within our environments to build movements and establish the ground for mobilization, action, and further publicly meaningful knowledge production. And in that sense, we could talk about various kinds of projects, various kinds of collaborations, various kinds of uh, network building that can take place. And I'll stop here. Thank <laughs> you.